The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Step outside of your comfort zone. See the world with a whole new perspective. Join us and experience the unexplained on the paranormal view. And welcome everybody right here to the paranormal view on the Para-X Radio Network. I want to thank everyone for stopping by tonight. Those are in the chat room, those listening from around the world, we appreciate each and every one. Um, tonight we've got a great guest lined up, and uh, he's, he's a stranger because he hasn't been on for about two months, seems like, but uh, <clears throat> we'll get him introduced here in just a second. Um, last week I wasn't on because I was at an event at Post Town, and uh, there was quite a few vendors there set up, but there wasn't a lot of people that actually come through. I didn't, um, I wasn't close to that many people and wore masks. Um, Mark uh, Spicer and I had a had a table, and the the table that was next to mine, Tiffany, uh, had her booth there. So at least we was able to talk anyway. So, but. <clears throat> It was nice just to be able to get out for a change. I talked with uh, Keith Age and um, a few others, and so it was good to actually just meet some people. So, um, With that, though, we got with us tonight Barbara Duncan. Maybe. Good evening, everyone. And we got Jeffrey Gould. Hello, hello. And uh, I'm sure that you know the guest that we got on. We got a lot of good stuff we're going to be talking with him about so uh jeff won't you go ahead and introduce our guest yeah well tonight we have one of our favorite returning guests thomas wortman former dean at the american national university state director at mufon and former co-director of that uh but still works with the cleveland ufology project and having studied uh business resources and such he's learned to read people when it comes to interviewing ufo witnesses so welcome back thomas wortman Thank you for having me back. All and, right. And I think it was August I was on here last, Henry. Well, it's been a while. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a while. And we yeah. missed we missed yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> oh. But you've been you've been pretty busy too, so we can't complain about oh, that. I always I always stay busy. I'm I'm one of those guys that even though I retired, I'm still up at either five or six in the morning. And I start my day off, do my hobby work, do work around the house and stuff like that. And I, I just can't, I'm just one of those people. I just can't lay in bed till like nine, 10, 11 o'clock every day. I'm like, even though I'm retired, I'm like, I'm going to get up and get some stuff done. Yep. I don't sleep late either. So. Yeah. And do it. I'd rather get up early and go to bed early. And of course, by nine o'clock, I'm usually passed out. So if you don't hear me for a while, you're going to have to holler and wake me up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I'm not that bad yet. I've got a niece that actually goes to bed at like six o'clock, and she doesn't have to get up early. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like the Ben Franklin you're kidding routine. Me. Early to bed, early yeah. to rise. Right, right. Oh. Oh. So I'm I'm sure everybody uh, missed us uh, being on here last week, but uh, Barbara had a had a good replay scheduled, so I'm sure everybody liked it. So, uh, <clears throat> with with all that, um, let's uh, find out, Barbara. Uh, anything uh, been going on on our side here? No, it's pretty darn quiet. We have a few new shows. Um, we have Barry Strom on Sundays now. I've seen that. Um, yep, and uh, kicking off there, and a show out of Louisiana or Texas, excuse me, Spirited Bayou, and uh, yeah. Growing and growing. Well, that's good. That's good. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, if we just get more people coming in, listen to the shows, uh, that'd be great. <clears throat> so, but I understand how a lot of things been going on. People's been pretty busy, and this time of year, it's always like that. So, uh, with that, uh, Jeff, how you been doing? Um, I've been. 
doing. We've been having some roasted temperatures uh, in the triple digits the last few days, but it's starting to wane down. But otherwise, the uh, economy is almost completely destroyed. So Government Newsom is having a good time, I'm sure. So And just a couple of hundred earthquakes, so let's see. Yeah, I've been hearing there's been quite a few of those around. Well, I had We had a good one down here in L.A. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and the Sultan Sea had about 120, no, 135 uh, earthquakes. It's called a swarm. Wow. Yeah. I'm glad we don't have too much of that stuff over in our area. Uh, although there is some, I guess, every now and then you might feel a little bit, but not very much around here. <clears throat> you have much up uh, north up there, Thomas? I, I, We haven't had that many. I, although I remember... It's been a number of years ago. We did have a great one, though. I was at work one day at my desk, and all of a sudden, the desk starts vibrating. And I'm like, what happened? Is somebody drive a tow motor by my office or what? <laughs> and and the boss came running, and he goes, what was that? What was that? What was that? And we checked the news real quick, and there was an earthquake. Huh. But we, we rarely get them up in this region unless somebody's over kind of like in the eastern part of the state where they maybe do some of the fracking and some of the stuff like that. Something like that, yeah. They may have something more along those lines, oh, yeah. Well, you, you got the New Madrid Fault so much here. there. You got the what, Barbara? <laughs> That's right. It's called the New Madrid Fault. Really? Mm-hmm. Is that on, mm-hmm. is that more over it in Pennsylvania? Uh, no. <laughs> um, I, I think it's more around Kentucky, the, the dam area, that sort of place. Oh, okay. Western Kentucky. Wow. Yeah. Well, we don't get get too much anyway. So, no. Uh, anyway, uh, we've been uh, talking some stuff about. Uh, I noticed that there was something in the the paper or on the news, I guess, about uh, the government was going to be releasing some information. And have you heard anything on that yet? Well, they started that program where um, they're collecting information. And initially, when you hear this thing about the government starting a special program to, you know, gather UFO reports, you kind of get excited and you're thinking, wow, this is this is Project Blue Book starting all back up again with maybe more people involved, you know, deeper investigations. And they're really looking at things seriously and things like. Let's say, for example, the um, with Project Blue Book, one of the issues that they had at times is, is whoever was in charge of the program basically dictated almost direction the, the investigations went uh, as far as a skeptical point of view or a you know real research point of view. So, you know, you're hoping something like that's going to get back up again, but I don't think that's the case because they they put this money up for appropriations for like the next year. And the plan was that when this program was started, that every so many days a report would be sent back into the government as far as what all data was collected. And what they're going to be looking at is reports coming in from military personnel. And they were kind of like a little bit vague, I think, but you're hoping that they're going to look at things from like air traffic control reports coming in from them, things reported at airports. And, and you know, there was that hope that they're going to look at things in general that came in from, like, police, anybody who turned their UFO report in, that they were going to be reviewing these things. But the way it looks now, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think what they're really going to be focusing on, Henry, is reports made in military operation areas. Because what they're looking for is really unidentified aerial phenomena. So it's objects that they can't explain. And they're going to be focusing on these military operation areas like off the coast of California, off the coast of the East Coast of the United States, and other areas around the country. So when there's these incursions into these areas, they look into it, and they're not saying they're looking for alien aircraft from outer space at all. They're not saying they're looking for anything interdimensional. What they're saying is we're looking at these reports for an identified phenomena. And I, 
I think the key point to look at is something that may relate to a foreign power. Maybe it could be private individuals who are taking aircraft into military operation areas and are going to be gathering reports on these. It appears to be it's so, a very yeah. serious plan. Go ahead, Barbara. So more in, uh, this is more intelligence gathering than it is actual UFO work. I th think that's what it's really going to be at the end of the day. I mean, the hope was when you hear this thing being announced that, hey, they're looking for UFOs. They're looking for, at these objects because, as they came out and said with the reports, that when the Nimitz event happened back in 2004, 2005, when the Teddy Roosevelt event happened back like 2014, 2015, there's videos of these craft, for lack of a better word, flying through military operation areas. Now, these are areas where it's known that they're conducting exercises. And what was happening with the Nimitz and also the Teddy Roosevelt is they were doing shakedown cruises in preparation for deployment overseas. So they're going through all the, the regiments where they're testing out their radar systems. They're taking their aircraft up and they're going through basic maneuvers. They're going through basic flight plans. So they're following these and these are the areas that these objects were intruding into when the Nimitz which is the, the most well-known event of them when David Fravor was out flying he was the commander of a squadron his squadron is out of two jets was out flying off the coast of California about 100 miles out kind of uh, southwest of California and over a period of two weeks Radar had been tracking ob objects going through the reason I say objects because it wasn't just one. There were multiples. They said over, over a period of two weeks, there was roughly, I think, about 100 objects that were observed over that region. The objects were being tracked on radar by a guided missile cruiser primarily. There were some signals being picked up by uh, the radar planes out in the area, the Hawkeyes. But they were weren't being tracked on the aircraft's own radar. Well, on one given day, one of these events occurred, one of the crewmen on board of the guided missile cruiser suggested to the captain that, you know, hey, these things have been coming in here for like, you know, two weeks, and we don't know who, what it is. Maybe we should look at it and investigate it. Because at times what was happening on there was they were tracking things on the radar that, excessive speeds and basically they said well we don't have an aircraft that can move, maneuver this fast go this fast and make these types of motions at these speeds so let's just ignore it because maybe it's a radar glitch maybe it's something else well in this case they went out and investigated it and they david fravor uh when he arrived of his wing person he was at twenty thousand feet he was told that he was at the same area where the object was he picked picked up nothing on his radar. The guided missile cruiser, cruiser brought him in, and he did a visual and saw the uh, an object which appeared to be either on the surface of the water or possibly coming out of the water. He didn't really know for sure. So he decided to descend down to get a better look. His wing person stayed high. As he descended down, uh, he gets like about 14,000 feet or so. He's kind of like doing a circular motion pushing going down, the object starts rising up and mirroring his action. The object, he said, looked like a tic-tac, tic-tac piece of candy. It appeared to turn at him. Next thing you know, he says this thing shot by him at a high rate of speed that he couldn't match, and he doesn't. He knows nothing in the Air Force arsenal or Navy arsenal that can match this. So, so this was one of the more well-known events, and then he notified one of his um, other pilots that did follow following missions, and the following pilot was one who actually got video of one of these things, of which the Navy admitted that this is actual video from a naval craft, a uh, naval aircraft. They don't know what is, what they're capturing in the video. They have no clue. They were basically saying it was nothing that they had. So this prompted this and other encounters were similar prompted the um, military
military to start making, you know, these moves towards establishing a program to start looking into what's incur, uh, you know, basically what's intruding in our airspace. Because again, these are 100 and some miles off the coast, and nobody knows what they are or who's operating them. Well, it's kind of funny that the way that they're doing this, that it's just all of a sudden that this has been going on. But this has been happening for years and years. Uh, Why do you think that they're just now actually trying to bring it out and acknowledge it? Well, it's starting to reach the surface (laughs) to like the public eye, not only the public eye, but Congress. Different congressmen also started hearing about this. And they're like, wait a minute, you know, we, we've got something operating off the coast and we have no clue what it is. Come on, we got to look into this because this is something potentially for national defense. This could be a serious situation. What if we find out that a foreign power is able to operate aircraft or some sort of a craft just outside of of our, you know, the 20 mile limit that we can't track, we can't stay with, we can't maneuver with. I mean, they've got to get information on whatever this thing is. So that that's why they established this program to start getting radar data, getting pilot reports, getting as much information as possible and making it easier for pilots to submit information on these encounters without being ridiculed by, you know, the the other military personnel or worried about their career being destroyed. Yeah, but Project Blue Book, if we could drop back just a minute here, was pretty high, cl- high clandestine uh, operation. I mean, for the majority of people knew nothing about or had an inkling about um, UFO uh, intelligence gathering, uh, but it really wasn't mainstream um, yes, report all your UFO stuff to us. Somebody will be by in, in, in a black suit to take your report. Um, yeah. So, I mean, this is a whole, like, 180-degree turn, don't you think, in yeah, their approach? A lot, well, a lot, uh, Blue Book looked at a lot of reports that came in f- from various people. I mean, they, they looked at a number of reports from my region, Um like the movie Close Encounters, the chase scene in Close Encounters is based on a UFO report from the 1960s mm-hmm. in Ohio uh, that was made by two deputies, and the report eventually reached Project Blue Book, of which they said that uh, they were chasing Venus, and then another point they said, well, maybe it's a satellite they were chasing, but it wasn't looked at very seriously. Part of the things that they did to based their opinion at times, was basically a judgment call. Well, it must have been this they looked at. Now, as the the television series presented Alan Hynek as being um, somebody who was working with Project Blue Book, he was a skeptic to begin with, but he became much more of a believer later on. He did look at things in a very serious manner. But I don't think they had all, all the tools available. In other words, you couldn't go in, you couldn't pull like flight data real quick. You couldn't pull satellite data real quick. It would be a much more lengthy process. And sometimes I think they just basically made a judgment call saying that, ah, we think it's this. And again, that went back to, you know, who was in charge of the program. One of the individuals who was in charge of the program was Quintanella. And he was a, more of a, much more of a skeptic. And the reports during his time took on that skeptical point of view. So that was one of the unfortunate things with it. Now it looks like when these reports come in, again, they're, they're not really being clear on the whole process that this program is going to be using. But if they see something off, off the coast, let's say California, they can get the military camera information. They can pull all the radar data. They can pull the information from the aircraft. And a number of these aircraft actually communicate together. So they're going to be grabbing all the data they can. They also have other resources available. They can go through different branches to see if they can get information. But I was hoping it was going to be much more in depth. That Okay, let's say you've got a number of UFO sightings. Let's say like the Phoenix Lights that they had. You get a number of things like that that maybe they would be looking at that. But I'm not sure if that's going to be 
in their realm. I think it may be much more like something in military incursions is what they're going to be looking at. If somebody sees a ton of lights over Phoenix, they may not even look at that at all. Well, I was thinking along the lines that, you know, there's these massive, there's science groups that are using the public to crunch a lot of data, whether it's SETI or CERN or any of those groups. Uh, and this sort of sounds like a, a mass um, data gathering um, by the public that the military can use because uh, I can just see um, astronomers looking out there going, hey, I don't know what this is. It doesn't act like a meteor. It doesn't act like anything I've seen. Um, and that they're going to be able to put this into a database for the basically the military to say, okay, let's go in and investigate it based on certain criteria. Yeah, yeah, based on certain criteria. And I think that's what they're going to look at. If, let's say, that sighting that, uh, let's say, an astronomer or somebody had of what may have potentially been a meteor, if that happens in an area where there's probably some a military incident where there's an encounter, they'll probably pull that correlating, potential correlating information into it. But if it's standing on its own, they may not look at it whatsoever. So you they, don't you don't think that they're actually going to be looking very much at sightings that's over land uh, around the you know you, the well any country because uh, they're mainly looking for stuff that's in the twenty mile offshore range. Well, they may be looking at something like over the United. States, there's a lot of military operation areas over the United States. Now, we've got some here in Ohio, in southern Ohio, but you pretty much have like local National Guard, uh, Air National Guard units using those. And it's not like it's on a regular basis as far as like every day. So probably where you're going to see the highest activity at or something, I think more so, Henry, that's in an area where it can can potentially go back to national defense, like along the coast. I'm just wondering if something along maybe like the Mexican-Canadian borders, along those borders and through there, specialized areas, um, like Area 51, if they happen to see incursions at, out in that region. Or there's a number of other ones out uh, west the same way. I, I, I personally just think they're going to be focusing a lot on those military areas mm. because that's where they're going to be able to gather the best data from aircraft, from sh naval vessels, uh, who knows, maybe satellite data, try to get, grab that. But I think that's where they're going to get the best information from. And that's going to be the areas that really go back to that big thing of national security. That's what I think is really going to affect what they look at. I wonder. Well, as we get closer to perhaps some sort of um, disclosure about UFOs. Um, and it makes me kind of wonder if at some point the military world governments are starting to think um, disclosure, even if it's by the aliens or ET themselves, rather than through um, um, Earth uh, governments that they're getting just a little bit more defensive? Maybe. Um, because when I when I looked at some of the things they were talking about, as they said, like in these reports for the the military, they also made a comment that a lot of that stuff is going to be remaining as a almost like a closed book, that they not, are not, not necessarily going to make that information public, that they gather from these encounters like they had back in 2004. They're going to get gather the data, review it, look at it. So in a sense, Barbara, I mean, if depending on what they release, and it may be heavily redacted for all we know, because we haven't really seen anything like that yet. But that may be the appearance that, hey, you know, we're going to keep our information on what we got. And if disclosure happens, it's going to happen on some event maybe that, you know, we can't cover up anymore. It just happens on a major level. But they're just going to keep gathering data. And one of the things I was thinking about over the last week real heavily is, 
you know, all this data they've been collecting, what if they've been, you know, if there is events like Roswell, uh, other events like that where they've recovered these crashed objects and they've been working on reverse engineering, maybe some of these things we're also seeing is the result of some of that reverse engineering after 70 years. That may be some of the things they're seeing off the coast. Because it always makes me wonder if there isn't some black program going on that somebody really doesn't know about. I mean, it would be, be very dangerous flying these objects into military operation areas and not let the personnel that's operating that area, let's say like the Navy, uh, the Nimitz fleet, let them know that, hey, you're bringing in this test ship, this test aircraft that you've developed. And you're flying it around naval fighters without them knowing about what it really is. I mean, there could be a collision. There could be other incidents. But I, the reason I say that, Barbara, is I found an interesting article that came out, and it was made by, by Dr. Dr. Will Roper, who is the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition and Logistics, he made a comment that the Air Force, the Air Force is flying the next generation fighter. That it's not just on paper, it's already in the air. Now, he's very vague on what the fighter looks like. He was very vague on, is it manned, is it unmanned? But he says... It's not just a model. It is a full working version of the next generation aircraft. And would that be like a UFO type thing? This is what they're not saying. They're not implying anything on what it looks like. But they're basically saying that, hey, you know, we've got like the uh, uh, F-35s. This is beyond that. This is the next generation fighter that is already in the air. Hmm. So and, and kind of like a real, go ahead. Have you heard whether they have actually said that they have been able to pick up some kind of transmission uh, between the objects? Uh, I know that they were chasing more than just one at a time, right? Right. They're chasing more than one, but they didn't pick up any transmissions. But these objects move basically in, in somewhat like a, uh, unison. I don't want to say a formation, but they moved in kind of like a unison. There was more than one. So, but there's something interesting I found in kind of like a related thing. What's going on at Area 51 right now? You you always wonder about places like Area 51, Henry. That when planes like the F-117, uh, you know, they're they're out going out of service. Right. Uh, there's still some flying yet, but they're mostly out of service. I believe you wonder what they're working on next. And then like the areas where like they develop like the um, SR 71 blackbird, the hangars and stuff they use for red. What's going on in those hangars now? Right. Well, there's individuals looking at the construction that's going on at area 51 and there's different ha hangars being built, but they said there's an interesting hangar now that's, it's really more, it's not a true hangar. It's more like just, a um, almost like a tent-like structure that's put up. That's all open-sided. Hmm. That you can't see what's underneath of it, but it's shielding stuff from the air. But it's all open. Huh. And the speculation is they're testing swarms of drones. Hmm. So they're taking not one or two, but they're looking at flying many more than that out in Area 51. And they said Area 51 to be perfect because it's it's not a huge area. You still have a a lot of land around there, but for, for smaller drones flying around, it may be perfect for testing. And they're looking at flying these unmanned drones in swarms. Huh. So uh, when I hear, like, the Nimitz story, I'm thinking, wow, they're flying these, these UFOs that's being spotted or more than one multiples. It almost kind of reminds me of the swarm type thing. So how could they fly in unison if there's if they're not picking up any kind of communication between them? Um, are they pre-programmed maybe? 
pre-programmed or who knows, uh, maybe they've got a form of communication we're just not detecting. Hmm. Uh, the ones that they're working on at Area 51, they, they speculate that the reason they built this huge structure, that they could put like a bunch of these little drones underneath, is they could do the testing on the electric electronics and the other devices to see how well they work in unison to see how well they communicate with each other and it's all being shielded under base like a canopy well japan already has um robots that can be controlled virtually uh using sensor uh, sense gloves and um, vr goggles and you can plug into a computer and run these robots virtually from across the world. So it wouldn't be a big leap of faith to think that there is an operations center somewhere that can control these uh, drones uh, simply by sight or a joystick for that matter. You're right. You're right, Barbara. And that was one of the things that I looked at like in the, I guess you could say connected to reverse engineering. The, you know, the number of times when I've been out and we've been talking groups about these or about UFOs, what the people eventually asked me about, well, what about Roswell? You know, do you think we recovered anything? And I said, well, you know, I don't see an artifact in front of me. I've, I've heard about reported artifacts, but I haven't seen the physical artifact in my hand. But you hear these incredible stories. And you have to say, okay, what if we recovered one of the these objects or more than one of these objects back in the 1940s. What would you do with it? Well, according to stories, you hear things being transported back to Wright Field, which is now Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And different ones sometimes say, well, you know, a lot of what we have now is based on maybe reverse engineering. But on the other hand, what if we couldn't really have the breakthrough under reverse engineering until closer to now, 70 years later, we may be seeing some of the fruits of this reverse engineering. What if some of these craft that they're observing off the coast are test aircraft that we're seeing that are flying by means of propulsion that, you know, we're, we're not familiar with gravity, whatever, you know, anti-gravity machines. And then the control mechanisms, like you mentioned, uh, from what David Fravor and some of the ones were describing, here's these things going up to speeds of like 4,000 miles an hour or more. If we were on board one of those craft, you'd be splattered like a bug in the windshield, you know, if this thing took off just by the pressure. The other thing is, is, it, is you're flying with these craft at super high speeds. If you think about turning or making maneuvers, by the time the, the human reacts to control this craft to make a turn at a certain point, they may be way beyond the point they intended on turning at. Well, this is where virtual reality was developed at originally, was for the military. They were looking at things along these lines. Well, what if, like you're saying, Barbara, we've now figured out the form of uh, um, controls of these craft, and these things may be working on much more of a, a method, like you're saying, uh, virtual or basically being controlled by the mind. As we know now, I mean, you've got more devices that's being developed that it can be controlled by the mind, implants. You've got like artificial eyes being able to implant or put images of what people potentially be seeing if these electronic eyes into their mind. What if now we're just making that breakthrough of a lot of the these devices that maybe were recovered and have been reverse engineered, just to throw something out there. Which kind of, it's interesting when you bring that up because it makes me wonder if maybe the next step towards Mars colonization is going to be some sort of VR-controlled spaceship and robot, uh, just because right now the um, radiation is a factor. Uh, where it wouldn't necessarily be for robotics. Uh, and then we could get a virtual uh, feel for the planet, um, even just by remote, temporarily, to build a colony first before you actually introduce humans to it. And, and you're right. That would be the safest way to do it, to explore, 
is you do it virtually. They were also talking about putting things on the moon, robotic, to assist with normal everyday operation. That way it minimizes the human. Right, because they can't stay up there for long periods of time because of the radiation. Exactly the same thing. So it would make sense to me. But Which I, also, I just... what you were bringing up about speed, and it kind of makes me wonder with any sort of, even with perhaps interdimensional travel, um, if it would scramble too much. And a lot of what we're seeing aren't necessarily biological aliens, but some sort of robotic probe. That's correct. And that and that's another thing, is that we may be seeing some sort of a probe that's robotic, that's being controlled, like you say, virtually. Well, now, I know... And, go ahead, finish. Oh, go ahead, Henry. Um, I know that a lot of times when they've reported UFOs and things like that, that they were able to, like, like when someone was abducted, they would be saying that these things didn't actually talk, but they used their mind some way to communicate with you. Would they still be able to do that and control different ships and stuff? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't done that one yet, Henry. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I've been involved in that one. I've been, I've been involved in my own personal one of the mind, but you know, who knows how far you know, they can control things. And I just think really like the virtual way, you know, controlling things remotely. Or uh, maybe they have a way of basically when the uh, best comparison I can make is there is a a Steven Spielberg miniseries on. It was called Taken. Now, this isn't the Taken movie with... Um, right. Le uh, Liam, Liam Neeson. Neeson. But this is the one that... Um, it, it they took a lot of the historical UFO mo moments over the years and condensed them into a miniseries. And some of the stuff was based around Roswell. In one of the parts of the... Um, miniseries they'd recovered craft but they were trying to basically fly the craft the craft was fl flown by not human controls like we think of like steering wheels and so forth rudders etc but they basically put their hand hands into a unit and it almost like linked the mind directly into yeah. the craft now that's what I'm looking at at is what if there's a way to basically link that person into the craft by let's say touch or whatever the mind that way it minimizes the transfer time of thinking you know and, and the hand motions and everything else it goes directly into the machine for lack of a better word now the problem that they ran into in the miniseries that per the story was the human mind wasn't strong enough right. and the people were actually dying because it was too much of a strain on their mind and they couldn't handle it. So they actually were looking mm -hmm. for a hybrid who'd had a much stronger mind. That much was the movie with Parker, brain. Parker Posey and Dirk Benedict. Okay. I remember it. Because uh, they were, and it, it kind of interesting that you bring that up because they kind of linked it to Stargate in a way because they were recruiting psychics. Uh, mm -hmm. to try to, to to figure out how the machine would work. Yeah. As and, I recall. Yeah. Yeah, and in the one of Spielberg, I remember they had like twin women uh that were like psychic something along those lines that they brought in. Somebody they were looking for people that had ESP. Things along, along those lines. And that's why they went after the hybrid basically to, towards the end is because they need into something strong enough. So, you know, it makes me wonder that you know, maybe, you know, since these things are moving very quickly, if something is on board, there must be a direct communication with the craft almost. That there's no hand motions, nothing like that controlling the craft. It's all through the mind. 
But it would also make sense, Barbara, as another, uh, I guess you could say another step to that. What if they're not even there? Maybe it's the cult being done completely virtual. That way, it could be potentially even done across the dimension. Well, a computer can think that fast, can it? Computers should think that fast. Yeah. And that's based on our technologies we have now. So I wonder if it's computer controlled. Possibly. Possibly. There's just so many things that we just don't know. That's the thing. And that's why when I look at like the military gathering data, maybe they're still in the dark as much as we are. And they're trying to gather every little crumb that they can to maybe put more of the pieces together if it's something that's not theirs. And I would have to assume that other foreign countries are having to do the same thing because they've got the same stuff going on there also. Oh, yeah. Uh, You'd never hear it coming out of China, but they have to have the same things going on in China. You hear stories at times coming out of Russia, but some of the stuff I've seen is, is more like stuff being made up for YouTube, and it could be a combination of maybe just people posting wild stuff just that's made up, or it could be a way of even putting out disinformation on what they're working on or what they know. And you stop to think that it looks like most of the elements are universal. So whatever they're constructing materials out of, it's something that we could theoretically reverse engineer because we could develop or the elements are already on earth uh, to come up with the the metals, et cetera. Right. You're right. You're right. And, And that was another thing I was actually thinking about the other day, Barbara, is if you recovered a craft, let's say we got a Roswell or one of these other crash events, what would you do with it? Well, first of all, I would, the thing I would do, I'd actually, bury the thing below ground in a secure facility because the reality is is if you recovered something how long will it take to reverse engineer something and if you put it below ground you really restrict access you don't even create like a hangar door for it to get out you completely seal it in because you know it's going to be decades or who knows millennia before you reverse engineer that thing this way it restricts <laughs> access um, like whatever's buried under the Skinwalker Ranch Road. Oh. <laughs> okay. Since you want to bring that up. Wait, wait. Did I miss an episode of the Skinwalker Ranch show that something's buried under the road? Oh, oh, that's there, no. I do now. I do remember they, yeah. they did. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. So there is a comparison, but also there were supposedly like things put below ground at Wright Patterson. And there's supposedly a lot of things below ground that you don't see going on at Wright-Patterson. What if a base, I'm not saying Wright-Patterson only, but what if a base along those lines, you put something below ground, you work on it, you reverse engineer it. First of all, I I don't want to destroy the original. And the bad part about reverse engineering is sometimes the testing and the methods to examine it are destructive. Well, if you've got two of them, oh, then, then, okay, it gives you more leverage. You can work on one. And keep the other one intact. So it's kind of like that um, project you're on a computer. You don't overwrite the disk, basically. You want to keep everything as intact as possible without destroying the original. And to me, I think one of the easiest ways, maybe, I, I could be completely wrong, but one of the easiest things to reverse engineer first would potentially be the materials it's made from. Because like you say, Barbara, if it's normal elements, elements we're familiar with, it's learning how to put those elements into a form like they have using whatever ratios they're using. That may be one of the easiest because when I look at other methods like, let's say, control systems, that is that could be so completely wide open. I mean, back sometimes when you, you read about crashes like back in the 50s and so forth on there, and I'm not saying the crashes were actual, but... You had people reporting seeing controls that you could almost equate back to like a a normal aircraft. You had had dials, you had other things inside of them. But but what if you looked at something that didn't have physical controls? 
what if you looked at something like I was suggesting earlier with the series taken where somebody just put their hand down in this thing and it made contact and somehow connected with the human mind. If you recovered one of those 1940s, you wouldn't have the ability to reverse engineer that thing maybe until now that you'd start learning, the, you'd start understanding how it works. The same would be true with propulsion systems. I mean, in the 1940s, we were just in the infant stages of jet engines. But what if you see something that's anti-gravity? Even if you pulled in people like Tesla, I mean, and had them on it for years, I mean, it may take them, again, decades to be able to start fanning how this thing really works. And then you'd also have to be able to develop a technology to make this stuff. So we may just now be seeing some of the signs of that that reverse engineering. So, I mean, I could sort of see the burying part. Um, even if we were being a little bit cautious about somebody trying to come back and retrieve uh, a crashed vehicle. Uh, and with our um, lack of technology back then to know that you know, there's, there was ground penetrating radar and you could find it probably fairly easy. That burying also was a uh, um, uh, an act of secrecy, sort of. Yeah, exactly. To keep everything as secret as possible. Okay. That way you have minimal access. I mean, anybody going into the, the thing would have to go through, like, tunnels, whatever, to get down to this thing. Also, uh, I was thinking about, okay, so let's say a foreign power hears that you've covered this object. They try to get, of course, spies to get in to see what's going on. Well, we have this happening at different um, facilities now which work on military projects where they, spies try to get in, spies try to take things out, drawings, etc. If you put it below ground, you restrict as much as possible people taking stuff back out without being observed. So it minimizes that. And the biggest thing is you, you know you can't get it out. You, they couldn't take the physical craft itself out, not without extreme measures. And then if you want to build one, maybe by then you've got the technology. You can build that thing elsewhere, not at that same location. And, and it's not one company building it. You compartmentalize the heck out of it so that you have a company like Rayathon working on maybe one part, Lockheed working on another part, and nobody really knows what the other ones are really doing. And very few know about the entire project coming together. Yeah. And now I really want to take a back coat of that road on Skinwalker Ranch. <laughs> I'll go with it, you, Barbara. How's that? It <laughs> makes sense. That that well that they opened up and he supposedly he had a radiation burn on that might have been mm -hmm. the access point. It may have been, and then that that radiation also dissipated, if you remember. That they went back and checked, and it wasn't there at another right. time. Hmm. But it, well, that it, could know, have been a that could have been a booby trap too, possibly. True, true. But it, it makes you wonder: was something there, and was something underground? And what was it? And if they had booby traps like that, that means they had to have something that they didn't want people to know about. True. True. And who knows what it is? I think we'll have to wait to what, season three? <laughs> season two? <laughs> Maybe. Well, if it goes the way Oak Island has, well, we're on what, season seven? And they still haven't found anything yet. So, uh, yeah. I've, yeah. I've heard that uh, they've already filmed two seasons ahead already. Nice. For Oak Island. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I, it's, no, no not Skinwalker. There for a second. Yeah. I, I do know that they've got yeah. the next season of Destination Fear coming out, too. Which is a fun show. It's a fun yeah. show? <laughs> well, it is. It's three. It's three. Uh, it's two friends and one of their sisters. Uh, the, guy, the, the host used to be the, a cameraman for Zach. Uh, Baggins, and um, they go to some of the most haunted areas, reputedly haunted areas, 
And the three of them, they're not officially scaredy cats, but they, they've been overcoming their natural inclination to run. Uh, and it's, it, I find it very funny. It's mostly unintentionally funny sometimes, and sometimes it's just plain funny. Um, and it's, it's a cute show. They've, they've got, they haven't gone to post town, but they have been, where are they? Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the places they've been that we know about. Um, I'm pretty sure they went to Mansfield at least off the top of my head, but uh, West Virginia, um, the, the jail down there or such like that. They, they've been to a lot of places. Hmm. Fun show. On the, on the travel channel, all paranormal, almost all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting because these UFO shows, and we've talked about this before, is I know they're trying to be scientific, and I know they're trying to be data-driven um, in their findings, but it would seem to me that if they had a psychic on there who can start maybe sensing things, like we were talking about what was under the road and what was in that house, and... Um, it kind of makes you wonder if if they had somebody there that could say, um, drill here or drill there, it would make more sense. Yeah, you're right, Barbara. I mean, if you had somebody there that says, you know, I have this feeling in this area more so than here, at least try it, you know? Yeah. But then you'd at have, least try it. You'd have to have a, a, a really good medium or psychic yeah. who... Who you could actually depend on or trust. Uh, or I mean, somebody who's had experience with UFO and alien um, psychics, for a better word, or had a psychic experience or a link. Well, that, that, then it makes it a little bit more, uh, oh, yeah, I get that weird feeling that I used to have over here. That would be Thomas. We, we take him. I'm, I'm available. <laughs> I'm not doing anything right now. Now I will maintain social distancing, you know. Uh, I guess maybe then we're going to have to start our own show then, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just putting the word out there. If anybody is listening, hey, I'm available, you know. Yeah, there, there you uh, go. Yeah. I, I would I would be willing to take that uh, trip out to Skinwalker Ranch and, and really be curious because I had somebody else the other day. Um tell me that you know they they see an aura around me and it's kind of a yellowish color hmm. okay so it looks like a bubble that ain't from where you got scared is it no kind of yellow no no oh, okay no they they just said it's kind of a yellow color <laughs> and it, it's it's they well, said no okay now we're we're gonna get off yeah sorry barbara you, I, you may I, I have got onto this role now yeah you may have put that up there yourself as a means of blocking them because yep. you were Protection. talking about blocking them. Okay, Barbara. That, you started it now. Okay. Here we go. Uh -oh. You started it. Uh -oh. Warm up the engines. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, the gloves this, coming up. This has come out only once before. Nobody ever heard this part before about my story. But back in, uh, matter of fact, just to let you know that I was told this, that it is a protective bubble that has been put up around me. That was what the psychic told me. He that, said there is a protective bubble around you. Is it that you put up or from when you had been abducted and they put it up? Okay, now let me tell you the my side of the story of this. Okay. After I heard that. Well, back in the 1960s, and it had to be like 1967, somewhere in there, when I was having my experiences, and, and just for those that you know may have not heard the stories before, back in the 1960s, I started having uh, um, bouts of sleep paralysis, and they were almost on a nightly basis. It started migrating into the feeling that something was coming towards me every night, uh, was coming for me. It was coming from a, always from, from a certain direction. Like it was just coming from that same point all the time. I would start, I thought as a kid, I'm like, 
looking for the monsters under the bed, basically, but I kept look, looking for something in the room. I felt something was there. And there were times also, Henry, that um, I observed the shadow type figures in the corner of the room. Well, I started getting very paranoid. Something was coming every night. And I started mentally creating a shield around my body. And I started every night as I'm laying down, create the shield, create the shield, put it up. They can't get to you it, or whatever can't get to you. I didn't, shouldn't say they can't, but whatever it is can't get to me. Well, so it's your listeners also know I've gone through regressions back to those same time frames where I was having encounters with the greys that the greys were the ones that were coming. And I was trying to keep that from happening. And when the psychic looked at me a couple weeks ago and said, you know, you've got this yellow protective bubble around you. It's almost like to keep something out. I told the psychic then my story and she says, well, you've probably created it and it's now there, period. It's like you created it and it can't come down or or you, you've got it to a point that it's not coming down to this day. But here's here's the part, though, too, Barbara. She told me, she says, they're still not done with you. I sense that. Ooh. They're not done with you yet. <clears throat> hmm. Sound like they're going to send some different <laughs> ones that maybe can break down the shield. I don't know, but I, I never told anybody about that creating that bubble around me. But I created that out of fear. And at times you look back and you say, was this a childhood fear that, you know, you developed as a kid that something was coming, like the monsters in the closet? But when I went through the regression, eh, it's what, about seven years ago now, something like that? Regressions, it indicated something potentially totally different, that there were encounters back then. And a number of encounters around that time frame and that's also when I saw the one UFO at treetop height. Uh, it was only about 30 feet above me hovering uh, as I was walking through the woods. It's, um, I did it with a buddy of mine. We, we, we both had the encounter together, and I, he didn't see the UFO, and I never told him to look up. And unfortunately, I can't go back and you know see his side of the story now because I found out he passed away years ago. And the curiosity in my mind is, why did he pass away but you know it these events i had went on for also a period of maybe about 10 years overall when i go back and look at it and from what individuals have told me off and on um, it's still happening occasionally that i don't know whether they're coming in checking on me saying hey uh are you tucked in at night you know you know, or they're saying, hey, let's check to see how you're doing. Maybe, you know, finding out something about me physically, I don't know. I have no clue. But the I, the one of the wild stories I heard one night that, that you look at, at on the surface and say, ah, maybe it's something somebody made up. But on the other hand, you say, what if it's true? Uh, was when um, one of my friends who's in Mufa, on, on the east towards the east coast we were talking one night and she says you know i've got a friend that she has had experiences over the years uh with encounters and abduction really and she goes yeah she was on board of a craft the one time and she says she's talking about all these other people on the craft and talking to one person in particular and she goes the more i heard her story she goes it sounded like you i said what she goes yeah yeah, this is about seven years ago now. She goes, it sounded about you, like you. And she goes, you want to know the freaky part? She goes, I took a bunch of pictures, laid them on a table, and she goes, well, what did the guy look like? And she pulled the picture she pulled out was yours. And I'm thinking, if you're making this up, you're doing a great job of freaking the heck out of me right now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you're doing a fantastic job. But... You know, you also look at the fact that could this be why 
that bubble's still there. Then in the back of my mind, somewhere back in the subconscious, I, I feel like it's still happening. Not on a regular basis, but maybe occasion. And there's something maybe just trying to prevent it, you know? you know. And maybe on that night, whatever it was, whenever that happened, it didn't work. <laughs> well, and here's the other thing to this, the clinical side, me wants to say, is that, okay, you're an anomaly. And if I were an alien studying different um, psychological reactions or physiological reactions with a human, I'd want to keep those anomalies and study them. <coughs> right? Right. True. So, I mean, maybe that's why she's saying they're not finished with you is because if you are that anomaly and uh, it's an interesting thing that they are going to come back and check because they're trying to figure out, okay, how do they do that? What caused that to happen? That, that bubble there? Hmm, interesting. We're going to have to figure out how to get around this. And maybe that's what they're coming back and trying to do, right? Well, so. true. And then also remember, I, I mentioned to you before that um, during the regressions, I had the feeling that um, when I was being regressed, I, it, and I still keep thinking about this, is I was laying down a table, um, no medical equipment around me whatsoever, just this room that had no, you couldn't really make out any details, uh, just have like a curved ceiling, dome ceiling. And here this being is looking me in the face and the being had these huge black eyes uh, you'd describe it as the gray and it really freaked me out because it, it, it kind of reminded me Barbara of that you know the doctors when they put the mirror on their head uh, I remember mm -hmm. that as a kid uh, I, I had the feeling it was almost looking at me like that you know like okay it's looking me in the eyes where's the mirror at on top of its head you know to go along with it you know so this this thing is looking at me and uh, when it was you know, looking at me, it was like it was reading into my mind looking into my mind not physically examining me but seeing what my mind is doing what i'm thinking my reactions you know maybe maybe that's what was really looking at emotions what my emotions were like and at one point i felt like i could view this like all of a sudden i connected into it like here's a connection that we had mentally all of a sudden and the thing it was it wasn't like now it was a one-way street where it was looking at what my mind was it was actually a two-way street so I was seeing what was going through its mind and expanding out into almost like a hive effect connecting with others of its same type and the, the best reaction I can make is it, it seemed to have no emotions but it was like almost the closest I can compare is startled when that happened when that connection happened that that was not supposed to happen. And, you know, kind of thinking back on that whole thing now, because I'd kind of forgotten about that bubble thing until she brought it up the other day. But maybe that was something that, who knows, uh, if that bubble is there, maybe that was something that was helped being created by that connection. That there's something that's been kind of opened up that wasn't there before. Hmm. Who knows? Just throwing that up for thought. Well, we can talk more about th about this after the break, and uh, I think it's about time for us to take a quick break. Um, so just remember, your mics are all live. Uh, we'll be out probably about five, six minutes, maybe if that long, and uh, we are going to let uh, I guess Jeff, you take us out. Is that the way it is? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much for, for a few years now. Uh, you're, listening, you're listening to The Paranormal View on paraifinx.com with your hosts, Henry Foister, Ceiling Cat, Barbara Duncan, and myself, Jeffrey Gould, with tonight's always excellent and wonderful guest, Thomas Wortman. So stay tuned for more of The Paranormal View after the break. <laughs> 